So uh, the first hour of the discussion was to recap our discussion from three years ago, what Dean Reed spent so much time uh, developing and studying and professing to us. Uh, now, this is where I really enjoy. It's where we get our boots dirty. Um, we really challenge these theories uh, and we put them in practice. We validate their, their cause um, and we have a lot of fun doing it, which is awesome. So here on, we're going to touch on some key examples uh, and we're gonna focus on three different components. Learning from integrating project delivery. We're going to discuss uh, production management and digital production control. And then lastly, something we've dubbed the team health assessment. Uh, at the end, again, I wanna make sure that we're talking. I appreciate anyone that approached uh, during that break. I look forward to continuing those conversations. Um, and please, again, feel free if you have a question uh, during the discussion, raise your hand, speak up. Uh, again, I appreciate the dialogue. So uh, the first reflection, or rather reflection of a project that I wanna focus on, uh, let's see, this was 2011. This was my first exposure to a true IPD project. Uh, it was a hospital built in Southern California. Um, <laughs> It was actually two miles away from where I had just moved, which was part of the lore of me then joining DPR. Um, I used to make the joke, uh, most of uh, my friends and coworkers, they, they lived about an hour and a half away, and they would always complain about traffic. And I would say to them, you know what, stop your complaining. You know, Do you realize that if I catch that traffic light at the corner, my commute literally doubles? Can you say your commute doubles? No. We don't have the same problems, right? They hated me for that, but it was a true statement. <laughs> uh, let me give you the back of car details on, on this particular project. Uh, it was a 19 month project. The actual budget at the end of the job was $151 million. It was a typical Southern California hospital, uh, Southwest design, if you will, with the stucco on the outside. Um, it was on a green field, uh, 35 acres. It was approximately 178,000 square feet, uh, 140 beds, and a 20-bed intensive care unit. Now, what was interesting about this, in most hospitals these days, it was all single beds, right? Because we are entitled to our own space, especially when our, we are most vulnerable. As I mentioned, this was a true IPD project in such that it had an integrated form of agreement with a certain number of signers. Now, again, John has his hot buttons that he really likes to talk about, and he really loves to talk about the IFOA and what it means to the project. John, you want to share a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, for those that don't know, IFOA, Integrated Form of Agreement, IPD, Integrated Project Delivery. Um, it's a contract type where there is profit sharing. So everyone puts their profit into a bucket. Uh, and if there's savings to the jobs, that savings goes to the bucket. If there's losses to the jobs, that comes out of that bucket. And it's equally divided between the slices of the pie, if you will. And that includes the owner, the architect, the designers, engineers, uh, the general contractor, and the main trade partners, as you can see here. So on this particular project, you can see the trade partners. We had the architect. The general contractor, which uh, I was a part of said team. Now, in this project, it was a joint venture. And the reason being is that when the owner was interviewing the team that he wanted to integrate project delivery with, he couldn't pick between us and a competitor that shall not be named. Uh, there was strengths and weaknesses to both of our teams, but together uh, we filled those gaps and we were a strong team. We also had the drywall and framing contractor which uh, John now represents, uh, mechanical and plumbing, which was a single contractor, electrical, fire suppression, and of course, the owner. Uh, now, there's a parking lot item there that uh, asks about the role of the client. And although I speak predominantly from the perspective of the general contractor, I can tell you that an integrated project de delivery or IFOA agreement it means very little if you don't have a true champion behind that. And that champion happens to be the owner, right? Uh, because uh, we all work for the owner at the end of the day. And if the owner compromises or undermines what it is that we believe is the end goal, guess what? User values define the end goal. 
So those user values have changed. Our objectives change. We can go from collaborative to combative because we don't have the support of the owner. Uh, so it's important that we do recognize them and their role in the process. And I believe that as we continue to fill the seats with more owners reps, that we will have a greater uh, chance of su success for spreading our, our culture and one day our contracts, right? To, to see this on more projects. Uh, we can continue to discuss more of the owner's role a little bit as we discuss uh, our case studies here. Now, I wanna go back to the project because when I showed you that picture, I didn't see a lot of oohs and ahs. I didn't hear them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but let's focus again on the 19 months and $151 million. Now that might not mean much to you. And that's because I didn't do a very good job of setting it up. I haven't given you the baselines, okay? So let's look at it one by one. To construct our project, it was approximately just over a million dollars per bed versus the average of $1.8 million. That was $730,000 per bed savings. And I had mentioned we had 140 beds. That's $102 million of savings from direct construction costs. That's huge. Let's look further. We completed the project four months ahead of schedule, and that's despite an 82 delay uh, associated with an environmental related impact. Now, I am not a big fan of birds, but there were literally two birds on our 30 plus acre site that were uh, burrowing, burrowing owls, right? And so they had decided to make a little hole there and we could not touch that ground for 82 days. That's nearly two months or uh, three months, right? Um, so despite that, we still were four months ahead of schedule. That's pretty cool, right? Four months is a lot of damn time, right? Relative to the normal, the average of a hospital at that time, which was 36 months, we completed it in 19 months. That's huge. Now, why is it huge? And owners would love to hear this. Well, at that time, an opportunity cost for revenue uh, per bed per day was just under $4,000, okay? 140 beds, uh, 82 days, I'm sorry, four months rather. So we're looking at a savings of $430,000 per bed over that period. And then if you extrapolate that, it's another $60 million. Now, we were one of the fastest scheduled projects uh, hospitals ever completed in Southern California uh, under the OSHPA jurisdiction, which is in the States, uh, known as one of the most challenging jurisdictions to work with. So this was a huge feat. Uh, and you'll notice there, I, I say, uh, debatably the fastest. Well, one, if it wasn't for those damn birds, we would have been nearly three months faster and indisputably the champion. And then two, the project that claims to be the fastest, there is some funny math. There's some funny math going on. I know I said that numbers don't lie, but their numbers, I think, lie. Well, let's, let's uh, figure it all out. That's $182 million, right? $162, thank you. Thank you for checks and balancing me. You could have said this before we presented the slideshow. No, $162 million, but my point remains the same though. What was my original budget? What was the budget that I said we ended at? 151, right? So we saved enough money in direct construction costs and opportunity costs that we could have built another hospital. Two for one. Who doesn't love a sale? And the other awesome thing is that every team member that participated in that project uh, received full uh, enhanced shared profit. So full profit was we put our pool at risk, right? We guaranteed that. And then enhanced profit, we exceeded so well that we are given additional monies, right? And again, if we're a manager and we're measuring monies and the number goes up, that means it's a positive thing. Now, that's cool, right? You're probably thinking like, quit bragging about your project, tell us how, right? How it's done, we're gonna get there, right? I'm not gonna get there alone though. We're gonna do it as an exercise first, okay? So what I would like to do is I would like for the group here to just shout out the lean practices or tools that you guys are accustomed to using on any of your projects, whether it's an IPD, IFOA, or other. Um, so we've got two charts because I imagine you guys are just gonna rapid fire. I can see the energy. Um, and we're gonna list these. 
All right. Don't be shy. Let's go. Name a lean tool or lean process. Lean tool. First thing that comes to your head. What do you guys got? Lean? BIM. Okay. Do you mind if I call that BDC? Thank you. Virtual design construction. Okay. Keep going. Look, he broke the ice. There Last feeling. Oh, you got it? I got it. All right. Keep it going. Very good. Okay. First run studies, that's a good one. Okay. Give John something to do over there. <laughs> Good one, CBA. What else? Good. Let's keep it going. A couple more. Let's fill this chart up. I'll write bigger too. Daily huddles. That's awesome. That's a good one. Oh, oh carts. Material carts. What about prefabrication? Anybody using prefabrication? Yeah. How about uh, some that we've talked about? We've got visual management, right? So we've got dashboards. BSM, value stream mapping, yeah. You guys do five Y's, you know, the five Y's. Yep. Okay. We got cluster groups. You know, cluster you guys groups. familiar with cluster groups? Okay. Cluster groups. You got it. What about A3s? Do you know what A3s are? Yep. Sweet. We're like needed to do my yoga today. <laughs> I think we're looking good. I don't want to picture him doing yoga. <laughs> <laughs> what else? You guys feel like that's pretty good? Okay. Well, I want to rattle off really a lot more. Um, so the reason that I chose not to put up a slide with all of the things that we did is because for that project, we literally tried everything. So there's nothing on these lists that we've put together that we didn't do. Um, I'm not saying that we did them all successfully, but what we did was run through a project in very rapid time. Again, 36 months to 19 months, right? So even though 19 months still feels like a long duration, in the construction world, it's not. We would try anything that we heard of, anything that someone from the room would shout out, we would try. We treated the project very entrepreneurial, right? Or as, I don't know if you guys have that saying, uh, we took spaghetti, we threw it on the wall and see we're stuck, right? And then whatever stuck, we were like, well, that's gotta be good. That's ready to eat, right? Um, but the reality is we were a little bit of cowboys for this project. We were moving so quickly uh, that we didn't take the time to reflect. We didn't take the time to understand why what we were doing was successful. All we knew is that it was successful. So much like I keep saying that if you look at a number and it's good, you say, oh, it's good, but you don't understand what drives that number. And so to that end, when we finally did take a moment to reflect, uh, we weren't able to give you the simple framework to success. Well, 
it so happens that uh, Dean Reed was one of our historians for this project. And it's actually the primary case study that helped uh, suggest and cultivate what we now know is the simple framework. Um, it was de developed to understand the levels of integration that we did without even knowing on that project. Uh, I'll tell you what we did know. We knew we had a whole hell of a lot of fun. Uh, we knew that we were doing something right, and so we wanted to learn more, and so we did. But this book took eight years to write. Uh, I think it was finally released in 2017, um, and that project started in 11, okay? It finished in 13, so four years after, uh, Dean was still trying to decode the madness that was that project. Um, and he's done a pretty good job uh, in the case studies that he highlights. And I hope that you guys think that we'll do a good job when we continue to highlight some of the case studies that stem from that project. Now, I mentioned eventually we did have time to take a breather because the project was done. So we were no longer racing, right? We were kind of basking in the glory. Someone's getting ready to write a textbook about us. That's pretty cool. Um, but we forced ourselves to do what we call a start stop keep. Um, a start stop keep is a reflective exercise that does exactly what you think it does. It identifies items that you should start doing. So things that are new to you or to the project, things that you should stop doing, things that you've tried that just don't work, um, and things that you should keep doing, things that have been proven in the process. And it's, it's really uh, not a qualitative ex or quantitative exercise. You get everybody in the room and you ask for everyone's opinion. Again, the 360 perspective. And I want to share with you what we learned from this project, which I think is the foundation for our continuous improvements from the projects thereafter. So to start, we wanted to understand the score. Uh, again, when the number goes up, great. When the number goes down, bad. But what does that really mean? Right? So why is the budget going up? Well, you can make a correlation. It's because we're being more productive, right? And so uh, that results in gains. Or we're value engineering. We're doing something more effectively or using a more efficient product. Um, but if you don't know how one impacts the other, what are you truly managing? What are you truly learning from the process other than looks good to me, right? Which again is what we kind of did in that first process, our first project. Things we wanted to stop doing is we wanted to stop holding design umbra our contractors uh, under a single umbrella. So traditionally, you have your architect, right? And they manage your civil, your electrical, your plumbing. Everything funnels through the architect down to the uh, specific disciplines, to their subdisciplines, then back up, right? Now, what that did is it created extra channels of communication and sometimes miscommunications. We had the case of the elevation again, right? The electrician, the architect, not always speaking the same language. So what we wanted to do is talk directly with those individuals that had uh, substance of opinions or input on whatever the matter might be. And lastly, one thing that we wanted to keep doing was onboarding all personnel down to the foreman level. Um, are you guys familiar with the concept of onboarding? Okay, so for those of you that don't, basically you join a project or you join a project team more specifically, and uh, you lay out the, the rules of the land. This is how we operate, right? We drive on the right side of the road or the left side of the road, or we, you know, yellow means you know, slow down, red means stop. You, you, you create that common language. You create that uh, shared goals that you define or have defined with uh, stakeholders as part of their organization. And you really get them to buy into what it is that you're trying to accomplish. It's with these three simple points that we were able to get a little bit better the next go round. I know you guys are probably tired of hearing me speak and you wanna see John sport his new jacket that he bought just for you guys. So we're gonna let him take over uh, and talk about his projects. Unlike Anthony, I actually double checked my math. So, uh, <laughs> if you find any mistakes, let me know, but I'm pretty sure it's right. <laughs> um, so our next project uh, was actually a project in Corona. Now the owner asked us to keep the JV together. It was about a $50 million two-story expansion, 100,000 square feet, um, and it didn't work out. It, the JV, too many uh, uh, cooks in the kitchen, as they say. 
the JV didn't didn't really work out. So our next project, the owner said to us, okay, DPR, you're going to be the general contractor. You're going to be the self-performing contractor. We're getting rid of that other contractor that shall not be named. Um, <laughs> they did just build the SoFi Stadium for the Super Bowl. But uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, but we're going to focus on DPR. We're going to have the same trade partners. We're going to have the same architect. We're going to have the same engineers um, and, and get going on this expansion. So we have our uh, Temecula Valley Hospital. Uh, as Anthony said, they wanted to add an expansion. We added a hybrid operating room, a two cath labs, a pack U, seven pack U's, seven post bays, um, waiting area, bulk storage, three ORs, operating rooms, shelled space, and additional imaging room. This was actually the first open heart uh, surgery center in this area. Before that, you'd either have to drive all the way to LA, which is about an hour and a half away, or drive down to San Diego, which is another hour and a half away. So we like to think that we save lives, as Anthony said. Um, which is pretty cool. We actually had a, a someone at our company have open heart surgery at that hospital after we opened. Um, we had the integrated form of agreement. We added some partners this time. Uh, the As you can see, our, our list is growing, so we have more profit sharing. Um, the concrete and drywall contractor, that's who I represent. We do the bones of the building. Um, there's a reason why... We like to self-perform. Doug Woods uh, is the D in DPR. Um, he likes to say that he would like to be a project where DPR performs all the scopes. He passed away this year, but uh, he would like to perform all the scopes. So why do we self-perform? Uh, just quickly, we want to we want to control the schedule, we want to control the safety, we want to control the budget, and we want to control the quality by having the general contractors. Um, and the self-perform group work for the same company, we are able to control those four aspects of the job and really have a second set of eyes that work for the same company and, and align. Um, Could I add a, a thought? So we did increase the number of partners, and, and that's from our first experience where we said we no longer wanted to hold the design uh, contractors under one umbrella. So by making each of them a relatable or equitable partner, uh, we were able to streamline communications a little bit more. And I think you'll see how as John continues. Yep. So on, on to that onboarding meeting. So an onboarding maybe lasted about eight hours. It was a full day event. We ran it out of space in a hotel, had all the trade partners that you saw on the last slide. Um, they were all there in the room with their foremen, their representatives, their engineers. Uh, and we came up with our conditions of satisfaction. Are you guys familiar with COS? So it's it's a term that we use um, on IPD projects uh, that that really it's a way of measuring if the project is successful. So at the end of the project, we can go back to the conditions of satisfaction and say we met all our goals, right? And we do this before even design starts because we're involved early, early on. Um, the trade partners are involved early, early on. And so as uh, you can see here, we have a safety, no scheduled interruptions, limited Oshpod review. Oshpod is this, um, it was developed in the 80s. It's a very stringent um, seismic. Uh, it mainly was required after, after many earthquakes destroyed many hospitals in California. So there had to be a commission uh, to uh, reinforce hospitals. And then the new, new hospitals can withstand up to like a eight magnitude earthquake. Um, so that's what Oshpod is. So no Oshpod non-compliance reports, delivery on schedule early, delivery on or below budget, maintain positive team environment, end users are happy with the project, no warranty callbacks, owner satisfied with controls and commissioning. So we printed this out, huge boards all over our construction trailer in the job site, and we would go back to them and make sure that we're, we're meeting all these tasks. Today, we're gonna focus on three of them and what we did specifically uh, to address them on this project. Unlike the other project where we were just, as Anthony said, we we're throwing spaghetti on the wall, we literally did all those things, um, but there was no real way of, of tracking. Um, so this project, we decided we need to track some of this stuff. So we have here delivery on schedule early, delivery on or below budget, maintain positive team environment. As we said earlier, we really wanted to focus on production tracking. Um, so we, we wanted to keep score. Keeping score is a big thing um, for uh, DPR specifically, um, but we believe that if you're not keeping score, what's the point? 
Um, so this is an example of, of how we do production tracking. This is an on-screen takeoff. It's just a program that estimators use to do quick on-screen takeoffs. Do you guys use that program at all? General contractors, no? Um, some of you. Um, but so you can see linear feet of wall here. Uh, and then this is transferred to a program called digital production control. So then I can click that wall. I can do my job walk on my iPad or, or on my computer later. I can click that wall and say, oh, it's 50% complete on this date. And then it gives me a report that says, okay, uh, you spent eight hours on that wall. You did eight linear feet. You're doing one linear feet per hour. Does that make sense? So it, it, it's very streamlined system and it gives you a quick, pretty quick production rate. And then you can compare that to your budget and see if you're on track, right? Any questions on this? So they had similar programs for HVAC as well. Same program. It would just be linear feet of um, HVAC or plumbing or electrical. Uh, the engineers would go through, mark, what percent complete it was at the end of the week, that report would be sent out to the whole team. Again, we go back to that slice of the pie. The architect really cares if we're making money or losing money. So they're interested in knowing the production rates, which is really cool. Um, unlike another NOR project, why would the architect, you know, give a, you know what, about production rates? But on this project, they actually do. So here's how the report looks that gets sent out to the team. Uh, we have our estimated budget, uh, so those are linear feet and hours. That gives you a that gives you a rate, and then you have your production rate right here. So you have that's you know that many linear feet divided by that many hours is your production rate, and then you have your uh, current rate um, to date. So uh, moving forward. We're looking at the actual versus the budgeted. You can see on line item like interior layout, we're way ahead of budget. We haven't started framing the walls yet, but we're doing beam stickers and top track. Does everyone see that? So um, from there, this report goes sent out and then a red flag happens. Red flag, we're half, we're about half the production rate. So something's going wrong, right? Why did we estimate the job double what we're getting in the field? So we, we we're able to see that in live time. So this is maybe a week or two into the project. We're able to see, hey, there's something going on here with this, this production. So it's top track. We're going to look at the design. We have a uh, go see with the structural engineer, with the architect. We're seeing that there's an issue uh, with production, mainly because the decking is at a 12 inch spacing. The detail for the top track says you have to have a uh, shot pin every eight inches. So not very efficient process. They would have to add a uh, 18 gauge plate, Let's see. 18 gauge plate right there uh, every time that you couldn't line up with the bottom flute of the decking. Does that make sense? Um, so what we did as a team is come up with a RFI, answered the RFI as the team, to try to improve our production rate. So here's our RFI, calls out for eight inches on center. That's not achievable. Uh, let us know if, if shot pins are acceptable. And so Tim is our structural engineer. He confirmed that uh, 12 inches are acceptable, uh, but if there's backing in the ceiling attachment, you'd have to use two shot pins on 16 on center. Much easier process than having to install that you saw that um, 18 gauge vent plate on the top of the top track of these walls. John, do you mind if I make a comment? Yeah, go ahead. So uh, John had mentioned that we answered this as a team. I actually remember this day. Uh, we were in a big room meeting um, and Tim lived in Northern California. And typically after a long day of meetings, he would run, catch an airplane and go back home to his children, right? But we had identified this and it was Tim who said, this is a problem and like, I want to spend the time to fix it. So he took the extra time before he went to the airport to powwow with John and members of the field to come up with what it would be an acceptable solution for the jurisdiction. Um, I would say that if we didn't have him in the same place and we didn't have the opportunity to have that open dialogue, we might not have had that answer maybe a week or two weeks or if ever at all, because sometimes 
the uh, designer might say, well, this is what the intent is, and this is the only way you can accomplish it. But he was there in the meeting, and then he was there in the field, and he understood the challenge that we were having. And although it's not his issue to deal with the production of a carpenter, uh, it became his issue when we all bought into the shared risk, shared reward. So huge, uh, huge point to make that so many of the benefits of, of the simple fame framework played into that RFI response, which just, look, just looked like a typical RFI response, but what went on behind those uh, scenes was huge. Yeah, and, and to Anthony's point, and going back to our, our breaking down the silos, right, we were able to, as, as the carpenter and the, and the project manager for the carpenter team, we were able to go directly to the structural engineer instead of having to go then to Anthony and then to the architect and then back to the structural engineer. By having this integrated project delivery, we're able to communicate directly and, and CC everyone else mm -hmm. um, on the team. So how did we end up? Pretty good. Uh, we, uh, we started at that 3.6, we ended up at 9.9, .9, having that new design, saved quite a lot of money. I think it was close to 60 grand on top track alone, um, just on that phase code. Um, and, it, and you know, this is a great example. So back to our project, we had a $42 million 13 month schedule. We find we saved shaved a month off the schedule and we saved $2 million to the owner and that profit sharing went back to individual slices of the pie back to the team. So in that pro in that instance, we had a 30 day improvement in a $2 million uh, savings and you notice we didn't have uh, the math, which apparently does lie, uh, <laughs> that we did with the other project. That's because in this expansion, there were no new patient beds. There were services only. So we didn't quantify the opportunity costs saved because that information is one, not as readily available. Um, but we were happy enough that we saved $2 million of uh, direct costs for the owner. So, uh, things that we we noticed on this project, um, design optimization, we really focused on that, unlike the previous project where we didn't really, we just were throwing a bunch uh, of lean tools out there, um, but we became more integrated on collaborative on this project and really broke down those silos. Uh, budget tracking, so not only was I doing that, the mechanical was doing that, the electrician was doing that, the plumber was doing that, door frames and hardware was in there, they were doing that. Um, and and we were able to adapt and those examples like that happened all over the place yeah and then prove morale everyone was really happy coming to work right if the guy that's in the same room putting in the electrical is making the the same profit as the guy who's putting in the framing and everyone knows that because of our onboarding process everyone's going to work a lot better in the sandbox right everyone's going to understand hey if i help that guy out and he helps me out we're going to make more money for our companies and therefore be rewarded. So I, I would, uh, uh, again, compliment it. The design optimization that John had mentioned was not just a higher level. We figured out how to build better. We figured out how to build better one RFI after the other. So, for example, on paper, the eight inch uh, spacing of the shop pins, it made sense for the uh, for the design, the way the, the, the math and uh, calculations worked out. But it didn't make sense for us putting the work in place because uh, no one would have known without really designing that detail themselves that you would have to add an extra strap, which in itself requires, what, two shop pins at least on each end? So you've already tripled the number of shop pins uh, that you're installing. So it was instances like that exchange that, um, that slowly improved the, the minutia of the detail of the constructability. Um, and when you create an environment where you are able to have these open conversations with the designers, um, you have a receptiveness from the field to offer more input, to feel value and understand how their work impacts the end, right? So yes, it's a process and yes, there's a technical component to it, 
but it's these exchanges, these interactions that reinforce the culture that I had mentioned, the framework without the, without the contract. So uh, the, other, the other thing to focus on is uh, tying back to my thoughts on, you see the number go up, you feel good. Well, it, didn't, it did improve morale, and we all correlated that with everyone made money, they were happy, right? Yep. But that's not truly the indicator of morale. That's just everyone made money, which it makes everyone happy, right? But there's more to it to talk about, right? Yeah, and even sending out those production reports, the guys take ownership, right? They want to they wanna do well for the team. So sending out those production reports to the entire team so everyone can see, hey, these guys are doing well on this space code. They're not doing that well on the other space code. They take pride in that. They take ownership in it. Sure. Transparency promotes accountability. Yep. Okay. So what's the one thing we couldn't measure? We were able to measure uh, production rates. We were able to measure budgets. We were able to measure quantities. But how were we able to measure morale? We, Anthony and I would, would go out to drinks or, or have lunch and we would, we would know, we would know that everyone wants to work again together. We all, we all want to be on this team and continue working together. We all got along great. Uh, we were really succeeding to the owner. Their owner was really happy with us, but there was no way to quantify as the engineer in me, there's no way to quantify that. So how do you measure a smile? All right. It's a good looking bunch. You can see that particular day is uh, we wrote on our cards what we stand down for, what we care about. There's a lot of family names up there, but you can see genuinely that they're happy. Um, and we want it to capture that, right? So if you don't have the ability to keep score, as they say, it's just practice. And we didn't want to practice success. We wanted to be able to recreate success. And so John had suggested or presented the production management, what correlates uh, budget and schedule, right? So with one KPI, you have an indicator of two key components of a project. Um, so we're able to keep score for that. It, we're able to see its impact, productivity's impact on uh, the critical path and or the critical budgets. And as much as I wanted to, uh, they would not let me take a ruler to measure the degree of everybody's smile. So we had to get smart, right? Um, and so this lends to our next case study where we decided, okay, we've improved so much from project one and project two. All of those things are great and we've got so much in our keep pile. Let's start getting better with understanding the morale, right? And doing it from a quantitative standpoint. This is actually an opportunity for break. Um, so afterwards, we've got one more case study, and then we've got half the window left for discussion and plus delta. So is everyone- a, We call that a teaser in America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really <laughs> leaving it open for you guys to really use your imagination. Is everybody good for a five minute break? All right, let's do that. <laughs> 